So what is ACLS? So ACLS, also known as Advanced Cardiac Life Support, it's simply a set of clinical algorithms used during cardiovascular emergencies such as myocardial infarction, stroke, or cardiac arrest. So how is ACLS different from BLS? Well, ACLS goes beyond BLS in which it not only incorporates CPR and how to properly use the AED, the defibrillator, um, but it's also catered to clinicians who work with critically ill patients, typically in an inpatient setting. And they must have experience starting an IV, administering these life-saving medications, uh, interpreting EKG, and advanced airway placement. So there are four types of ACLS algorithm, and depending on what the arrhythmia the patient presents, that's gonna determine which algorithm is appropriate. So the one that we're gonna focus on in this video is the uh, cardiac arrest algorithm. Now, typically patients with pulseless rhythm, such as VFib, pulseless VTAC, pulseless electrical activities like PEA, or asystole, they would be appropriate for this cardiac arrest algorithm. All right, so let's get started. So let's say you enter the patient's room and you notice that the patient is unresponsive, okay? You check on the patient and you notice they're not breathing, there's no pulse. So always remember to know what the patient's code status is, okay? I, I can't, I can't like focus on this anymore. Sometimes I've seen situations where, you know, this patient is getting full on like the whole works, right? And 10 minutes later, patient was DNR. So make sure if the patient is full code or if they're DNR, um, if they are DNR, then really honor their wishes and know specifically what interventions are in place, okay? But if they're full code, then just go ahead and proceed with the cardiac arrest algorithm. Okay, now that we got that down, um, so, First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna immediately activate your hospital emergency code response, okay? Or in this case, a code blue, okay? And then you're gonna get down and dirty and you're gonna go ahead and begin CPR, all right? You're gonna be doing 30 compressions to two breaths at the rate of 100 to 120, okay, per minute, okay? Um, at this point, a crash cart should be in the patient's room. Uh, AED is applied onto the patient, okay? The AED will detect whether the rhythm is shockable or unshockable, okay? They're not shockable. A shockable rhythm, that's gonna include VFib, right? And or pulseless VTAC, okay? Unshockable rhythm, on the other hand, are PEA, pulseless electrical activity, and asystole, okay? These patients do not have any electrical activity and therefore there is no existing electrical component for the AED to deliver that shock. Um, they however will depend solely on quality compressions until a shockable rhythm is detected. Another unshockable rhythm are those whose heart rhythm conducts pulses such as normal sinus rhythm, superventricular uh, tachycardia, SVTs, uh, PVCs, AFib, etc. Okay, these patients are alive and they do not require defibrillation because if you shock or defibrillate these patients with these rhythm, you're going to risk putting them into a deadly rhythm. Okay, it's just going to make things go south. The joules that you are delivering during defibrillations are going to be much higher and it's going to cause a lethal outcome to these patients when these patients have the, those pulses that I mentioned earlier or the rhythm. So they may, however, require uh, cardioversion depending on their presentation, okay? Because the cardioversion jewels are much lesser than their defibrillation counterparts. But for now, we're just going to draw our attentions to responding to patients with shockable rhythm. Okay, so now at this point, I'm going to separate this into two different categories, all right? There's going to be the left side, which will indicate whether the rhythm is shockable. And then there's going to be the right side, which it indicates that it's not. So starting on the left, let's say the monitor picks up a shockable rhythm, okay? Whether it's VFib or pulseless VTAC, all right? Shock is deliver. You shock them, 
okay? The goal of the defibrillator is to restore a normal heartbeat by sending uh, electric impulse, okay? Typically, most hospitals' defibrillators are going to be bifa biphasic, okay? So the initial dose would be somewhere from 120 to 200 joules. From then on, you're going to continue quality CPR for about two minutes. And at this point, you should have the RRT, the rapid response team. The RRT gang arrives, all right? A nurse would try to start an IV, okay? And there should be another nurse documenting and keeping track of time, okay? It's going to be really important. Next, you're going to do another rhythm check. Is the rhythm shockable? Okay. If no, then you're going to check if the patient has something called return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC, which I'm going to draw here on this branch. Okay. Um, but if the patient is yes for ROSC, then we're going to progress into post cardiac arrest algorithm. Uh, but really, we're going to focus that on another video, okay? So ways to determine if ROSC is achieved is really based on their presentation, okay? Is the patient breathing? Are they coughing? Is there any signs of movement? Are they gasping? Um, and then the clinical findings will be such as, you know, using a capnography to determine their end tidal CO2, okay? What's the end tidal CO2 value? Fun fact, ROSC was also known as, quote unquote, the Lazarus phenomenon, okay, in relation to the biblical story in which Christ resurrected Lazarus from the dead. So it's a pretty cool thing because, you know, similar with patients who have cardiac arrest, they're dead and you do all these different uh, interventions, which typically will hopefully, knock on wood, revive them, right? So it's kind of cool. All right, so moving forward, if the patient continues to not have a pulse, okay, but they do have a shockable rhythm, then you want to deliver another shock. You want to ante up the jaw, okay, ante it up to the max, increase that baby up, right? Because some cardiac arrest patients are going to be very difficult to defibrillate, and they're going to require more than the initial 120 to 200 joules. Okay, now continue another set of quality CPR. And this is really important, guys. Keep in mind that you should have very minimum interruptions between shocking and delivering uh, CPR because minimum interruptions, that's going to ensure a higher chance of survival, okay? And also at this point, you should have an access to an IV and you're going to give your first medication. You're going to give epinephrine one milligram as an IV push and really make sure that you flush it well with about 10 cc's of normal saline, okay? Now, the rationale for the epinephrine is really to ensure that the patient's arterial blood pressure is increased and it's going to lead to better vasoconstriction in hopes of allowing coronary perfusion and cardiac output. And also really keep in mind that you can give epinephrine as really as early um, as you gain IV access, okay? And you're going to give it about, you know, every three to five minutes. It's really not necessary to wait at this point to push epinephrine. And you're probably wondering like, hey, uh, how fast am I giving epinephrine or how slow am I giving epinephrine? Honestly, the truth is you can slam that baby as much as you want because the patient's already dead and it's not going to, you're not going to kill them anymore. They're, they're dead. So just get it into their system. Okay. Now. Also, at this point, the patient should be considered whether they're a good candidate for uh, advanced airway, okay? And also, you're going to be checking their end tidal CO2, which is going to be measured by the capnography to determine how well they're ventilating, how well their ventilations are. Next, you're going to do another rhythm check. Is the rhythm shockable? No? Okay. Go ahead and check for ROSC. Yes, then shock and continue CPR. For two minutes. Now, at this point, you want to access, um, or I'm sorry, you want to assess for any treatable causes that might have caused the patient's cardiac arrest. And what I'm talking about is it's the H's and the T's, okay? The H's, right? Hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion, right? The acidosis, hypo or hyperkalemia, hypothermia, toxins. 
Okay, now we're going into the T's. Toxins, tamponade from the cardiac, right? Tension pneumothorax, thrombosis pulmonary, um, and or thrombosis from the cardiac, okay? So these are the H's and T's. These are uh, things that may have caused the patient to be in a cardiac arrest. Okay, now moving on. Now considering giving the patient their second medication, which is going to be their initial dose of amiodarone or amiodarone, okay? You're going to give about 300 milligrams, okay? And really the mechanism of action for amiodarone is that it is an anti-arithmetic medication and it's utilized to slow down the heart when the heart is fibrillating or quivering out of control, okay? So you want to slow it down in hopes of producing normal circulation. And amiodarone is used typically after the third shock, okay? Now, the second dose can be given, um, and instead of giving the full 300, it's actually going to be given half. You're going to give it, you're going to push it about 150 milligrams. Make sure you flush that with 10 cc. And you're also probably wondering how fast or how slow am I giving it? Just slam that baby in because the patient's dead. You're not going to kill them anymore. Okay, so now you're thinking at this point, what do I do next? Well, now you can just loop back to the algorithm, okay? If the patient has unshockable rhythm, then you want to check if ROSC is achieved, okay? Are they moving? Are they breathing? Um, things of that sort. But if there is a shockable rhythm, then you want to go down the chain of the algorithm, right? You want to shock, CPR, uh, give epinephrine every three to five minutes, shock, CPR, et cetera, et cetera, okay? This can go on for can go for a long time, it can go very short. Really, it's just, it goes indefinitely until the code is called off, right? All right, so now we're gonna be moving on to the right branch, right? The non-shockable rhythm or the unshockable rhythm. So as I mentioned earlier, some examples of unshockable rhythm are PEA, pulseless electrical activity, and asystole. So let's say, you know, your patient has an AED attached to them and it reads unshockable rhythm, right? You immediately want to start CPR, two minutes, okay? 30 compressions to every two breaths, okay? And it's very, very important thing to know. I, I want to just kind of stress this out here also um, to the general public, if you're kind of taking interest in this video, is that you cannot shock an unshockable rhythm, okay? The name is right there. And I'll repeat, you cannot shock an unshockable rhythm. A lot of times, right, when you're watching these medical TV shows, okay, they would show someone desperately trying to shock someone who is flatlining, who's having a Sicily, thinking that it's going to bring them back up to normal sinus rhythm, okay? But as mentioned prior, it's impossible, and you're just going to end up wasting valuable time, okay? So instead, what you really want to be focusing on is just provide quality compressions for two minutes, okay? That's key, CPR. Okay, so as you have someone doing compressions for two minutes, you wanna be doing the following. You wanna make sure that you establish IV access. You wanna administer epinephrine, okay? One milligram IV push every three to five minutes. You want to see if they're a candidate for advanced airway and end tidal CO2 monitor, okay? You're gonna check the rhythm again. Do they have a shockable rhythm? No. Okay, it's unshockable. Um, so assess if the patient has ROSC. Are they breathing? Are they gasping? Is there movement? Um, but if it's unshockable, then you're just gonna go ahead and resume CPR. Now, similar to the left branch, um, you wanna also be assessing for treatable causes for cardiac arrest, the H's and T's. And at this point, the algorithm loops back to uh, the shockable rhythm. But if it's not shockable rhythm, then you're going to go down this branch and proceed with quality CPR followed by one milligram of epinephrine, okay? But if the monitor does pick up shockable rhythm, either VFib or VTAC, then you're gonna follow the algorithm on the left. Now, I just really want to preface that oftentimes these interventions, they can change to the right side versus the left side of the algorithm. And that really depends 
on the patient's presentation. So there you have it. That's pretty much the nuts and bolts of ACLS cardiac arrest uh, algorithm. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. <laughs>